There are no neutral images of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. It is necessary to be aware of the point of view from which these representations are constructed and to query the purpose of their construction. For the history of representation is as much a history of misrepresentation. The Aborigines, their degraded ancestry and evil and the women prostitutes were seems to be irksome to them. From the time of invasion, Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders have been presented to the world almost exclusively through the eyes of the European colonizers. They were written about and sketched and painted and photographed and filmed, possibly more than any other indigenous people. Yet there was little real communication between the two sides about culture, language and beliefs. The European focus was on physical differences and strange exotic eating habits. It is impossible for, it seems to be, for, for most of colonial um, history and representation in Australia to establish an Aboriginal person who is just another human being with some different ways of doing things. Um, it has to do with the colonising imperative, the imperative to, to control and contain in order to steal and plunder. And when people come to terms with that and, and try to deconstruct it, uh, and, and, and find the devices, literary or filmic, to represent Aboriginal people as human beings, then you start to get away from the colonising imperative. The stereotypes were established early. Prevailing theories of racial superiority gave authority to the prejudice and paternalism of colonial attitudes. Some of these 19th century distortions have remained distressingly current. The power of a people to say who they are, the power to define their own identity and to relate their own history, is fundamental to their sense of existence as a people. To deny their law, their language, their culture, let alone their land, is to attempt to take away their human status. For these are the measures by which Europeans acknowledge peoples as worthy of respect. But for over 200 years, these attributes were systematically stripped away from most of the indigenous peoples of Australia. When Australia was occupied by the Europeans, the Industrial Revolution was in full swing, and by and large, the Europeans at that time were thinking that they could conquer the world, they could control the environment, they could do things. They had a very positive view of themselves. They came to Australia and saw people who had different values, different beliefs, and a different system of organisation. An organisation which they believed themselves at that time they had left behind thousands of years ago. They saw Aboriginal people as Stone Age people, and because Stone Age people had been in England some thousands of years before, they believed that therefore Aboriginal people were thousands of years behind. The land was declared empty, terra nullius and its inhabitants classified as uncivilised. The marginalisation of the original inhabitants is reflected in the way that they are pushed even to the margins of early illustrations. In a parallel way, they were later marginalised legally and physically by a bewildering array of government policies. The power of defining Aboriginal people became an instrument of control in the hands of others. Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders have been held hostage to the perceptions of non-Aboriginals. The assumed superiority of the dominant point of view is implicit. This report is a fragment of their living, a fragment of how people live in this year of 1960, only 20 miles from the Melbourne GPO. What do you spend your money on? Our own. On myself. Would you like to live in a better place than this? Oh, of course I do. Uh, well, why, why do you live here? Why is it necessary? Why do you feel it's necessary for you to live here? Is there nowhere else you could go and work? Well, there's live? nowhere else to go to. Have you found any prejudice against you? Have you tried to go anywhere else? No. You, you haven't you. tried yourself to go anywhere else? Oh, no, I never tried to go anywhere else. 
Don't you think it would be a good idea if you did try yourself to do something for yourself, to go somewhere else, to work somewhere else? Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to. But I think the most pathetic thing that I've encountered here is that these people have very little initiative and very little will to try and improve things for themselves. We talk to each other not just face to face, but through metaphors and symbols and so on. So you might take all the um, historical symbols which explain to white Australians their own perceptions of Aboriginal society. Okay? Um, and, and many of these symbols are nothing other than universal symbols taken from elsewhere in the colonialist world. So you can track the absolutely equivalent plot in Tarzan of the Apes, Phantom, the Phantom of O Ghost Who Walks, um, Crocodile Dundee 1 and 2. And so many of these historical symbols and icons are colonists' tales. They're the colonial legends. And their purpose is, although one, I shouldn't be so determinist about it, um, is to explain to the younger generations coming up, the white generations, the non-Aboriginal generations, this is what it means to be white. It, it has to do with the conquering impulse. And it's very Anglo. Um, I think it goes right back to St George and the Dragon. To conquer by any means necessary the wild, you see? And this, this also, this notion of the wild is very powerful. Whites look from their garrison settlements to the exterior of their garrison, garrison settlements. And anything outside the garrison settlement is the wild. And it must be slayed, colonised, conquered. If you look at the environmentalist movement today, you have the Wilderness Society, uh, the World Wildlife Fund, and so on. They cling to this notion of the wild. For Aboriginal people, there is no notion of the wilderness. There is no wilderness. But Europeans insisted on picturing Australia's indigenous peoples as savages. Whether the view was romantic or scientific, the images confirmed them as primitive. The fascination the, and the function of the primitive is, is of course, to define the civilised. Um, they're, they're the counterpoint to ourselves. So if we can show um, others as being primitive, um, of unbridled sexuality, bound by their genes, um, inescapable, na um, have natures that are absolutely set by their genes, unlike us, of course, who can modify ourselves and so on. So they're a very essential counterpoint to our notions of being civilised. Um, it's, it's, it's very interesting. In this century, the, the primitive has been a fascination for some of the greatest thinkers of the century. Freud, um, the anthropologist Malinowski, the, the father of anthropology and so on. Um, the primitive they were interested in, of course, bore no relationship to any people in the world. It was an archetype and a construct taken from all notions of primitive that we'd had from the times of the first you know, Hellenic cultures that we inherited. History, too, incorporates a particular point of view. You hear about things like Attack Creek, where blacks attack the whites. But what about the other side of the coin? They were being attacked first because their land was being invaded. Genocide of the people as a whole, poisoned water holes, poisoned flour, shot, hunted like kangaroos. That's not reported in Australian history. It's not possible to separate Aboriginal history and non-Aboriginal history in all senses, because you do have a contact history. So that if you look at the Western District of Victoria in the 19th century, you have a history of massacre. You have a history of atrocity. Now, non-Aboriginal people obviously should know about that. And may, they may want to write about it. They may want to research it. And in a sense, when they do that, they will come into contact with an Aboriginal history, with an Aboriginal culture. So therefore, it is never going to be possible, or I think desirable, for non-Aboriginals not to come to terms with these issues, because this is what Aboriginal people are asking, that non-Aboriginal recognise these hidden histories. 
And to recognise hidden histories will involve non-Aboriginal people researching and writing about these issues as we do. I increasingly believe that where Europeans write Aboriginal history, they should make themselves the subject of the study rather than the Aborigines. I think if they do that, they will bring into question how their forebears have acted. I think there's an enormous need for Europeans in this country to come to terms with the way in which they've acted towards Aborigines. And that this will come about if we make ourselves the focus of Aboriginal history. Aborigines will, of course, write Aboriginal history in their way, and they will be the focus of that history. It seems to me that, in a sense, there should be a racial division of labour in the writing of history. So marginal to white history had Native Australians become by 1901, that when the Commonwealth of Australia was founded, they were deliberately excluded from the Constitution. They were not even to be counted in the census. They became invisible in the cities and removed from the Australian public conscience. In a sense, I think the invisibility of us relates to um, what was getting on with the job of wiping us out and, um, and, and viewing us as subhuman, so actually not knowing how to speak to us, not, uh, not even thinking that we may have had social structures in place, not no dialogue with us, um, a view of us as exotic, a view of us as, as, um, as dying out, as not being able to keep up with modern, the modern world. The Darwinist notion of survival of the fittest saw Aborigines treated as specimens and measured physically to prove white superiority. Popular writers such as Daisy Bates said that Aboriginal people were a dying race as if this were a result of some intrinsic racial inferiority. This ignored an ability to adapt even to major geological change and to survive for thousands of years. Those who did not die out were expected to be absorbed into the white race to disappear. The federal government is today accelerating the transition to white ways of living. The policy is one of social education, until the Aboriginal people of Australia can live as the white people do. There are critics of the methods of assimilation and some doubts about its success, but there is no possible alternative. This supposedly benevolent policy is now viewed as just another form of genocide, the deliberate elimination of the race. In effect, Aborigines were being offered a grim alternative, assimilate with the whites or die out. Either way, it was clear that officials wanted Aboriginals to disappear from the record as a distinctive race. The many diverse peoples of the continent were lumped together under the generic term Aborigines an undifferentiated, nameless mass. Aborigine isn't a name. It isn't a proper name. And the first settlers didn't bother to find out our names. And most people today don't even bother to try and learn our names. I've used the word Kuri, which means our people, uh, uh, to refer to everyone in Australia, although it's used mainly in the southern and eastern states. But that was the first thing. If you study slavery throughout the world, you find one of the first acts is to de-identify the people by calling them a name, making them nameless, by using a generic term such as Indians, niggers, natives, aborigines. And therefore, people looking at the situation will be less worried about it because they don't seem to be real people. But by and large, Australian society has always looked at aborigines as a plural collective. It's a whole bunch of them, never individuals, all our legislation, all our programs, um, all our task forces are predicated on dealing with them as a collective. And in fact, whether it's in health or in any field that you care to name, if white society was treated as collective as Aborigines are, we would be screaming in revolution. 
White Australians have continued to deny even the most obvious differences between the peoples they colonised. There's never been, I suppose, a, a line drawn between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Torres Strait Islanders have always been, as far as I, as far as I can see, have always been included as being Aboriginal. Um, uh, and that, I suppose, that dates back to the way the government policies were written, that, that you know, the definition of, of Aboriginal includes Torres Strait Islanders. And it's only recently that, um, that people are, are beginning to recognise that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people are very different. I think when people have seen photographs of Torres Strait Islanders, we're a Melanesian people, and people don't recognise that Australia has a, has a Melanesian people as part of their population. We're a different culture of people. We're, we're sea people. We're not, we're not nomadic. Um, we've protected our islands from, from day one, from the, uh, the people of Papua New Guinea and from the Aboriginal people. And those two, those two indigenous people themselves, you know, they, they have got the numbers. And yet, uh, 20 or 30,000 Torres Strait Islanders in the middle, we've protected our own uh, culture and heritage. So, um, basically, we want to be recognised as an individual indigenous race and not be swallowed up um, with, another, with another culture. Although white Australians ignored cultural variations, they were very interested in, and remain interested in, shades of colour. As according to the whites' racialist classification, only full-bloods counted as real Aborigines. The decline of the race could be scientifically charted. But this could only be done by denying Aboriginality to the increasing number of fairer-skinned Aborigines. The denial of Aboriginality to non-stereotypical Aborigines has become an obsession with some white Australians. Related to this is, is, is so much of the argument that occurs as, as to, you know, what part Aboriginal you are. You know, when people ask me that question, I say, all of me is Aboriginal. And some people can't understand that because I'm obviously not blue-black. And, you know, the, the assumption nowadays is that unless you're, you're, you're that colour, you can't be a true Aboriginal. But you see, we don't acquaint our relationships this way. In our languages, it's, it's, it's acquainted according to who our mother was, and our mother gives us our moiety, and our moiety gives us our whole relationship within the whole group. So I can be blonde, blue-eyed, and have absolutely fair skin, but as long as my group knows exactly what my moiety is and what my clan is, I'm an Aboriginal and I am part of that group. We're being challenged about our identity um, in relation to those things. Um, recently I, I spoke to a group of nurses about, um, uh, they, they'd seen a film called Black Men's Houses which is about, you know, made by Aboriginal people living on Flinders Island and, um, uh, and, and one of the students who hadn't seen it said to me, but I thought, she said, that their documentary was, was made that there were no Tasmanian Aboriginal people left. What do you say about that, she said. And, uh, and it's just this, uh, again, I was asked to prove why um, these fair-skinned people had the right to say, um, to argue the fact. And, uh, I mean, and one of the things that occurred to me, that if, if those Aboriginal people on Flinders Island hadn't married non-Aboriginal people, they would have disappeared off the planet. Whites cannot or will not see fair-skinned people as Aborigines. This remains perhaps the most galling of European impositions. This attitude is supported by the continuing power of the popular image of the traditional Aborigine. Look over there, look! Oh, look at the little pickaninny, Charles! Everybody shouts at once. We think we've found what we've been looking for, a really primitive Aborigine family on walkabout. Harry, bring your camera up. Get a close-up of the way that fellow stands. Over the rocky hills and mountains, they are keen of eye and tireless of foot. And they have what is most important of all, 
an inexhaustible fund of skill and patience. Even the media prefer to use images of obviously Aboriginal people in their stories. For Aborigines, regaining control over the way they are presented and identified is essential. Most people featured Aborigines in their films as tragic subjects, um, dispossessed, um, drunken and so on. Um, out of this came um, the accusation today by very many Aboriginal people that um, the film and television industry has hindered their development by only showing so-called negative stereotypes of Aboriginal people. Um, in the 60s there was a move, and particularly in Sydney, where young independent filmmakers realised that um, filmmaking, the filmmaking process was a process about power and that this power needed to be devolved in some way. And out of that came a deliberate attempt on behalf of groups like the Sydney Filmmakers Co-op to make the means of film production available to Aboriginal people. This was the beginning of the great change in representation, um, where Aboriginal people um, had pushed for this and they got the support of people within the industry, even though at the edge of the industry, the independent documentary section of the industry, um, where they wanted to be in control of their own representations. And today, in the 1990s, Aboriginal people are the greatest producers of images on Aboriginal people. They far outstrip white production. Aboriginal writers too emerged to increasingly take control of representations of themselves in literature and on the stage. I get very worried about the notion that non-Aboriginal people can define Aboriginal people for them, about them and to them, which is often the case. We have the non-Aboriginal experts writing about um, our very lives, our very spirituality. I really detest this. I think that it is not fair that another culture, another person can own one's own soul or psyche. And I think that only Aboriginal people can do that. And if we're given the time and space, we can actually do those, um, that defining on our own terms. But we're not sure about um, how far we want to share that experience with non-Aboriginal people. Um, the history, the historical legacy has been such that there isn't a great amount of trust that has developed between black and white Australians on a mass scale. There might be on group and individual ways, but until that's done, we will we'll never feel at harmony or uh, in spirit with white people. Aboriginality is about the essence of identity. It's about being Aboriginal, the whole history of repression, the whole history of oppression, the whole history of genocide, all of these things which result in the feelings and the emotions, um, the dignity or the lack of dignity, uh, the psychological yoke of forever being a, a disrespect or an unrespected people, a people who are trying to get out from under, people who are trying to empower themselves in a variety of ways, and all this comes under the rubric of Aboriginality. It's also an attempt by Aborigines to escape from one of the most appalling things that they've suffered, which is that they have constantly, since settlement, been defined by others and never allowed to define themselves. Now, the essence of Aboriginality is something that basically only Aborigines can talk about and should talk about. So there shouldn't be a, a, a row, there shouldn't be an emotional row about this if we're prepared to see that some subject matter rightly belongs monopolistically to Aborigines and some material, it doesn't matter whether it's Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal. In terms of who can teach Aboriginal studies, I think 
whoever is sensitive to Aboriginal people who get very much an in-service training about Aboriginal culture, who have a sensitivity towards Aboriginal people, who meet a criteria of wanting and who have a commitment to telling other Australians what Aboriginal people's experience has been, I think those people are quite welcome on my behalf to teach it. But I don't want people who have never spoken to an Aboriginal person, who've never been to a community, who don't have Aboriginal friends, who try to speak like the white experts do about us, who get their stuff from textbooks rather than consulting with Aboriginal people. They're the kinds of people that I don't want to teach Aboriginal studies. But it's not good enough to have goodwill. It's about doing some homework and some research in a topic that is well overdue. It's 205 years of distortions, lies and truths that are, untruths that have been told about us. We'd like to stop that and get a rich Aboriginal studies depicted in the curriculums and into the psyches of every non-Aboriginal person in this country. The way people are represented is a key factor in the way others relate to them and also in the way they see themselves. Now Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are claiming back the right to represent themselves.